Will you bow your heads with me? Father, as we open your holy word, I ask that you would cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Fill my life with your Holy Spirit's presence and power. Speak to me, through me, and for me. I promise you, Lord, I'll always give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to the book of Galatians, chapter 2, verse 20. The book of Galatians, chapter 2, verse 20. It is one of the most pivotal verses of Scripture in all of the Bible. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Every Christian pastor is compelled to ask himself this question. How do you preach on something as important as the cross and not exhaust its themes and principles? You know, I get concerned for people who get tired of coming together at church to worship and sing and pray and praise God. For this is what we will be doing throughout eternity. Did you know that throughout eternity we will be studying the lessons of the cross? Here's what the servant of God says. She says, the cross of Christ will be the science and the song of the redeemed through all eternity. Throughout eternity, we will be studying the science of the cross and we will be singing the praises of the cross. The truth is, in the cross and the crucifixion, there are so many lessons that it will take us an eternity to understand. My God. Today, I want to look again at the cross of Calvary. That text, I am crucified with Christ. Come with me to that time when the Lord Jesus walked to Calvary. His path was one of conflict and cruelty. From his arrest in Gethsemane to the betrayal by Judas, the Bible says in his darkest hour, in the book of Mark, chapter 14, verse 50, in his darkest hour, the Bible says, and they all forsook him. Those he had counseled and mentored, his disciples who had pledged to be faithful and true, they deserted and forsook him in his time of crisis and need. The angry crowd took him from Gethsemane to the courts of Annas and Caiaphas and then sent him on to Pilate. From Pilate he was sent to Herod and then back to Pontius Pilate again. He was paraded like a common criminal from one hall to another. The crowd that followed him hurled, hurled their insults and mockery upon him. 
They stood watching as Jesus was tortured and beaten. They were amazed that he spoke no words of accusation or incrimination. The old Negro spiritual says, when they crucified my Lord, he never said a mumbling word. With epitaphs being hurled against him, still he carried himself with firmness and dignity. After being beaten for a second time, he was taken again back to Pilate. And after hearing the crowd shouting and screaming, give us Barabbas, Pilate washed his hands of the matter sealing our Lord's death sentence on Calvary. The cross that had been prepared for the crucifixion of Barabbas was then laid upon the bruised and bleeding shoulders of Jesus. Since the Passover supper with his disciples, Jesus had no food or drink. And in his weakened condition, he did not have the strength to carry that cross, that cross that weighed over 300 pounds. You know what it's like to carry a 100-pound sack of anything? I've done it. You can't do it long. Here he had to carry a cross. They tell us weighed approximately three pounds. With such a heavy burden and the weight of the sins of the world upon his shoulders, it was too much for Jesus to carry. And with every step, he fell fainting beneath the load. You would think that after all the good he had done, all the miracles he had performed, all the people he had healed, you would think that someone who had been rescued from ruin some lone soul who had been delivered from disease and death would have had the courage or the decency to show Jesus a little compassion, a little sympathy. To the contrary, as he stumbled and faltered beneath the load, the crowd around him only mocked him and taunted him. The soldiers picked him up and tried once more to put the cross on his back. Again, Jesus fell fainting beneath the load. No one standing around would help, for to do so would have made them ritually unclean. He was carrying it to make us clean. But suddenly there appeared a man named Simon of Cyrene. He had come in from the country, unaware of what this drama and spectacle was all about. He heard the jeering crowd, their mockery of Jesus. He heard them laughing and shouting at his feebleness and helplessness. And Simon stood there, shocked and appalled. Brothers and sisters, I hate to say it, but this morning I have to say it. No religion in history including our own, has ever created people with tender hearts. Only the Spirit of God can do that. No religion in history, including our own, has ever created men or women of conscience. Only the Spirit of God can do that. And without the Spirit of God, all religion is false. Without the Spirit of God, all religion is a deception. Without the Spirit of God, all religion is a distortion of the will and character of God. In this world, there has always been true religion and false religion. And today I want to tell you the difference. True religion was created by God. False religion was created by Satan. True religion is never opposed to the will of God or to the plan of God. False religion pretends to champion God's will and God's plan. 
True religion is love. And the test of all true religion has always been and will always be love. Amen. And where there is no love, there is no true religion. False religion is cold and formal, even heartless. False religion is to be dreaded and never trusted. The servant of the Lord said there is no savior in false religion. True religion is a practical, personal experience of God's renewing power within the soul. True religion is the implanting of Christ's nature in our human nature. True religion is Christ dwelling in the life as a living, active principle. True religion is the grace of Christ revealed in the character. True religion is the grace of Christ revealed in your character and in my character. Jesus Christ is the center of all true religion. False religion is a gigantic masterpiece of satanic power. And Satan uses False religion to rule the earth according to his will. False religion is a dangerous, worthless religion. The true religion wants to learn the will of God and watch for the leadings of the Spirit of God. For too many people who come to church week after week don't realize they are adherents of false religion. False religion is lacking in vital godliness. True religion is imitating the character of Christ. That's true religion. True religion is powerful. It is the exercise of pity and sympathy and love in the world, in the home, in the church. False religion is powerless. True religion is obedience to every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Throughout the history of the world, I hate to say it, but I got to say it. We have seldom seen true religion. Look at what James 1.27 says, pure religion. James 1, chapter 1, verse 27 Pure religion, pure religion, undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to do what? To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. I got to tell you, I'm saddened to tell you that in this nation of ours today, much of what we call Christian is false religion. The silence of the church today in the face of evil is a false religion. Here Simon sees the crowd shouting and laughing at Jesus and Simon stops True religion stands with those who are powerless. True religion stands with those who are powerless. True religion has compassion for the helpless and the immigrant. True religion has compassion for those who have been marginalized. True religion has compassion for those who are oppressed. False religion is selective in its compassion. False religion is selective in who they want to help. And it is also selective in its moral outrage. <laughs> you will be outraged about this, 
But because of your politics, you won't be outraged about that. False religion is selective in its moral outrage. A Babylonian religion and its outrage depends on which party you belong to. I don't care what party you belong to. If it's wrong in the eyes of God, it's always wrong. The Roman soldier sees on Simon's face signs of sympathy and compassion for Jesus. And so they drafted Simon and placed the cross of Jesus upon his shoulders. Now Simon had heard of Jesus. His sons were followers of Jesus. But he himself, he himself had not yet made a decision to follow Jesus. But I know something stirred in his spirit. When he saw the attitude and the character of our Lord carrying that cross. But with the cross of Jesus on his back, Simon took that cross. He understood that it was God who had granted him this eternal blessing, the privilege of being the only man who was blessed to carry the cross of Christ. The only man who was blessed Jesus with kindness in his darkest hour. For the rest of Simon's life, he would cherish this miracle in his life that God saw fit to so order his steps that he would be right there when his son needed to carry the cross. I know it was God who chose Simon. Yeah, that was not an accident. It was God who chose Simon. It was an act of providence. It was God who divinely ordained Simon to be right there where he needed him to be so that he could bless his only begotten son. Anybody know that God can arrange the miracles you need to arrive when you need them? I've seen God work miracles in my own life. There have been days when the burdens got heavy. In my own life, and, and, and I have, maybe you'll understand what I'm about to say. Some people, when things get rough, they cry themselves to sleep. Uh, when things get rough, I pray myself to sleep. Oh, yes. I call on God until I, I go into slumber. Asking God for faith and strength to carry the burdens that have been laid at my door. And I can tell you that God in his mercy and God in his grace has always sent a Simon. He's always sent someone along to bless me and help me and carry the load and the burdens that I have to bear. When they reached the crest of Calvary's hill, they tied Jesus to the cross. Someone said they stretched him wide and then they brought out the hammer and the nails, and as the nails were driven through his flesh, Mary, his mother, fainted with grief. Great drops of sweat gathered upon his brow, but Jesus did not cry out in pain or agony. His face remained calm and serene. I want you to know, Jesus could have called fire down from heaven to consume those who were executing him. And I had this thought, did you know if Jesus had called down fire, the flames would have been glad for that assignment. <laughs> let us at him, Lord. Let, we want to get him. They would have been glad to do our Lord's bidding. Those flames would have gladly eaten up those soldiers handling Jesus with such callousness and cruelty. And as the cross was lifted to the sky, it was dropped with great force into the hole that had been prepared for it. And that jarring, that jarring caused Jesus sharp pangs of pain and agony. But he never cried out. I'm told that Pilate wrote an inscription to be placed over the cross of Christ 
<laughs> My God. Pilate decided for himself. He was going to write mm, the inscription that was placed above the head of Jesus. The inscription was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And it read, it read Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. The priests were so offended, they asked Pilate to take it down. Yeah, to change the inscription. Pilate said to them, it will not be changed. What I have written, I have written. The servant of the Lord says that it was God. Check this out. It was God who guided Herod's hand and Pilate's hand to write what they wrote as a prophetic witness to the truths God prophesied in the word. Did you know that the soldiers who put Jesus on the cross gave away to each other the clothes of Jesus? Yeah, they shared, my God, my God. They took his clothes and shared it amongst themselves. But his tunic, his robe, was woven through without a seam. It was, it was one complete cloth. So his robe was one solid piece of cloth. So they deemed it unwise to tear it, to share it. So that's why they gambled and cast lots because it was so beautiful they didn't want to tear it. All this was going on while Christ was being crucified. Church crucifixion was a punishment set aside only for the worst of criminals. It was a horrible way to die. Sometimes the agony for the one being crucified lasted for days. Those who were crucified on the cross were allowed to have a concoction to drink to deaden the pain. But when this was offered to Jesus, he tasted it, knew <laughs> as soon as it hit his lips, he knew that it was mind-altering. Yeah, some of us know the first moment you put that vodka, that something to your lips, your brain tells you, whoa, this is mind-altering. And Jesus, when he knew it was mind-altering, he refused it. People always ask me, what's wrong with wine? In wine, it's, if it's mind altering, refuse it. God the Father was to be his only source of strength. The one being crucified did not die from the wounds in their hands or in their ankles. What happened was the blood in the head and in the upper body was forced down into the lower body until the person lost consciousness. And there on that cross, as Jesus hung there dying, the priests, rulers, scribes joined in with the mob who mocked him as he died. And that day on that hill called Golgotha, Jesus was alone as he suffered on Calvary. Even his father was silent. The people shouted, if thou be the son of God, come down from the cross. If you be the Christ, save yourself. Well, that day watching Jesus dying on the cross was not only the jeering mob. The servant of the Lord says Satan and his angels were at the cross in human form. They too were present at the cross. And let's be clear, they wanted to be sure that he died. Christ could have come down from the cross, but that act of self-preservation would have destroyed the plan of salvation. Ah, oh, don't ever forget I just said that with you. That act of self-preservation would have destroyed the plan of salvation. If he had come down from the cross, Jesus knew if he did, you and I would be lost forever. Lost without the hope of redemption and restoration. And in that dreadful hour, Christ, the prince of sufferers, would have to tread the winepress alone. And at the ninth hour, the Bible says he cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Father, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? 
and all that Jesus endured, church, the, the blood drops that flowed from his head, his pierced hands and feet, all the agony that racked his frame, the unalterable anguish that filled his soul at the hiding of his father's face reminds us of all that Christ endured to open to us the gates of paradise. When Jesus said, it is finished, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Right then, a bright light, check this out, surrounded the cross. And the face of Jesus began shining with the brightness of the noonday sun. Now, you got to understand that when he said, it is finished, a dense darkness covered the earth, but his face was shining like the sun. And then there was a hoarse rumbling like heavy thunder. There was a violent earthquake and mountains and rocks and boulders were torn like a magistrate tears a guilty verdict up. Tombs were opened, souls who had died were brought forth from the graves as first fruits of the resurrection. The priests and rulers and soldiers, executioners, all of them, they, I love this, they stretched themselves out on the ground in fear and terror. But thank God in the death and crucifixion of Christ, eternal redemption has been secured for all who believe and all who surrender and accept God's plan of redemption and restoration. Never forget that the plan of salvation is both redemption and what? Restoration. The plan of salvation is both redemption and restoration. We have been redeemed, but we are to be restored. Redemption is when you buy back what was already yours in the first place. Restoration, on the other hand, is a lifelong process of conforming and aligning your will and nature and choices and character with the loving character of God. Now, looking at the path and process of crucifixion, we strain our hearts and minds to understand our scripture this morning. What did Paul mean when he said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me in the light which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul here is saying, I too choose the path of crucifixion. I am crucified with Christ. I too choose the path of crucifixion. But it's not the crucifixion on a Roman cross. Paul is saying, I choose to die daily to my selfish human nature. It is not a physical death. It's a daily dying to my carnal nature. But a strange thing, strange thing, said Paul, even though I die daily, I've never felt more alive. Yet I live because as I die, Christ lives in me. And I want you to know this simple truth of Christ living in us is what these emblems are about. The more we understand it, the more it opens to us a vault of spiritual understanding that changes the way we think and live forever. Christ lives in me. Sinful me. Erring me. Corrupt me. He lives. He lives in me. How can I understand this simple truth? living in me, this formative, I call it a, a formative truth, a normative truth. It is the path to redemption and restoration. It is a truth that reminds us what a true 
Christian is Christ lives in me. A true Christian is one who is crucified with Christ and has Christ living within. A true Christian is one in whom Christ is alive and Christ is living. Here Paul is telling us that before Christ li can live in us, the first thing he says is, I am what? Crucified before he can live in you. There must be a commitment to daily, lifelong crucifixion of self. A crucifixion of my carnal habits. Let them die for heaven's sakes. Crucify them. A crucifixion of my proclivities. Jesus help us. A crucifixion of my preferences. A crucifixion of my awkward, wayward personality. <laughs> Some of us have not only an awkward personality, we have a wayward personality. A crucifixion of my cravings and my desires. Before Christ can live within, we must embrace a daily dying to self. A daily crucifixion of self. Before Christ can live in us, because ah, we are selfish, we are self-centered, we are self-absorbed. You see, brothers and sisters, for Christ to live within, self must die. <laughs> oh my God, help me to make this clear. This is true of every soul. In every human soul, one must die and one will die in every human soul. One will be crucified, either self or Jesus. That's why Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. For only when self dies can Christ live. Only when self is crucified can the presence of Christ dwell in us. So what does Paul mean here when he says Christ liveth in me? Is it the physical Christ? Then what does it mean? Before I leave you, I want, I want you to understand what it means to have Jesus living in you. Well, to understand this truth, you have to embrace a new normal, a new way of thinking. And I want to share that new way of thinking with you. I believe God has shown me that there are a number of ways that Christ lives in us. And I, before I leave you, I'm going to name a few of them. First, Christ lives in us through his words and his teachings. That's why if you want Jesus to live in you, you have to study the word of God. For in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was? That's why we need to study the word. The word was with God, the word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. To bring Christ into our being, we must have a reverence for the study of the word of God. When you memorize those scriptures, you are allowing the word who is Jesus to live in you. For Christ to live in us, we must take the word of God for ourselves. When in our Christian experience, the word of God becomes our meat and our drink. When we behold him, when we receive him, day by day we learn to reveal the principles in the word of God. Oh, I'm talking about how Christ lives in you. So brothers and sisters, Christ, when you choose to let his words and teachings become the overriding, guiding principles in your life, Christ is living in you. Somebody say amen. amen. Say, Pastor, I never understood that. I never understood that. That when I study the word of God and when I embrace it and when I live it, Jesus is living in me. When the dominant overruling motive 
For every word you speak and every thought you think are the words and teachings of Jesus, then Christ is living in you. Uh, you're going to stay with me before I close today. Christ lives in us when we allow his words and teachings to become the dominant prevailing force in our lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. The second way Christ lives in us is when we allow the heart of Jesus to dwell in us. The love that was in the heart of Christ is to be in our hearts that we may reveal that love to those around us. We need to be daily strengthened by that love. When the love that's from the heart of God is in your heart, Christ lives. Somebody said, he lives in me. Secondly, thirdly, Christ lives in us through his spirit. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again. I will send you the comforter, the spirit of God. The spirit of God living in you is Christ living in you. Brothers and sisters, another way Christ lives in you, I hope you're ready today. He lives in you through his character. God help me to make it clear. He lives in us through his word, through his heart, also, he lives in us through his mind. Let this, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. When his mind is in your mind, Christ lives in you. Somebody says he lives. I am crucified with Christ. Yet, huh? I live. Let's look at that text again. I am, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet, oh, oh, hold on, yet. But look at what he says. Here's what he's saying. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, but it's not me. That's what it means, that old English, yet not I. And all it's saying is, it's not me, but Christ living in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And when we partake of these emblems, they represent his broken body and his spilt blood. We take them in but that's not how he lives in us. He lives in us through, what's the first one? His word, through his word. He lives in us through his heart. He lives in us through his mind. He lives in us through his spirit. And he lives in us through his character. Somebody sing that song, He Lives. As we prepare, let's sing that song, He Lives. Somebody say, He Lives. He Lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He lives, yet not I, but Christ. 
lives in me. Let's sing it again. I serve a risen Savior. Hallelujah. Yes. I know that he is living. Whatever men may say. Oh. 